Uh, my name is Michael, and thank you so much for joining us this evening, making the time to join us. I wonder just how many vast wilderness areas remain still on planet Earth. Places, in fact, where there are very few lights. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our hosts, uh, the couple Beverly and Peter Pickford, who are the authors and photographers of the incredible Wildland Project. And uh, we are very blessed that they're going to take us on adventure um, through four of these last remaining wild places. And I'd love to ask them to start at the very beginning, how this all came about, how after 40 years of doing the work they did, they decided to go on this odyssey around the world to these vast wilderness areas. Uh, over to you, Peter and Beverly. I hope you can hear me clearly. I hope you are well. And maybe you could just start at the beginning, how this idea came about. Good evening, everyone. Now, super to be with you. Uh, where did it start? It started about 45 years ago when Beverly asked me, what do you really want to do? <laughs> and uh, I'd never really thought about that, but wilderness has always been a passion. And um, I guess that this project started, um, we'd done nine previous books, nine photographic illustrated books, and we were looking to do something that uh, had a worldwide appeal, not just a localized market appeal, but we were also, I think the principal drive was really to um, do something that had relevance to people con in, in a contemporary sense. And I think that everybody that is interested in wildlife, interested in conservation, driven by n a love for nature, is aware that things are changing and changing fast. And uh, it became very apparent in the 40 odd years that Beverly and I have been doing this, that what we were seeing in our lifetime was an incredibly rapid change uh, in wilderness areas. Wilderness was, was getting a lot of pressure uh, from, from the expansion of the number of people. Uh, there was also, oh, the sun's about to come out. I feel like I'm being spotted. <laughs> but um, it, the wilderness was getting a lot of pressure from uh, the expansion of people, but not only that, the utilization of land was also becoming uh, a place that wilderness was getting a lot of um, arguments against it. And we decided that we really wanted to put together a, a project that would speak about, not only about wilderness, but how fast it was disappearing and how precious it is and how much uh, we felt that the time was now to actually address the conservation, the urgent conservation of wilderness. So we decided to look for a publisher that would um, help us create a project that would encompass the whole world, something that we could talk to everybody about. Can you draw and that? How did you, how did you... I, uh, I think that we, we it, it was terribly important after the privileged time, the privileged life gonna, sorry. that we had out there, so to speak, that we, it was time to, to give something back. We really thought that we have to, we have to in some way put something back into, into the time we've had and share what we were seeing because it, it was so clear to us. But we realized that people living in cities and people with different callings in life couldn't possibly see it in the same way. And this is why we needed to do this journey ourselves, because as much as we read and as much as we could research, we could never really be certain until we'd actually seen for ourselves. And, and I think that is why we had to look for those areas. And how did you find those areas? Were you up in your mountain uh, home in Filiersdorp looking out? How did the idea come about to, to, to find these wild spaces? And, 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 and how did you do that? Well, it, it was a very interesting uh, thing, Michael, because we were, we were struggling to actually find wild, you know, uh, areas that were wild. As soon as you start digging uh, information on wilderness areas, the more remote it becomes, 
it becomes exponentially less information. So, you know, it, it was promising when there was little information, but we couldn't confirm that that was really the place we should be looking at. And then one evening, when sitting on our, our home, we had a, a nature reserve up in the mountains at that stage. We had a big farm and uh, it turned it into a nature reserve. And we were very high up and I was looking out over the valley and I suddenly realized I could see the lights of the towns far away. And then the, the idea hit that we should be looking at where light is because where light is, is where humans are, it's where human populations are, it's where human infrastructure is going to be. And the areas where there's no light are the most likely places to, to have wilderness. I'm going to share with you, I've put a couple of slides here together. This is just a, um, oh, how do I get this? Hold on. This is a, a, a slide that shows the lights at night around the earth. I don't know if my cursor will come onto this. I'm, I'm technologically challenged. Um, but if you, if you see, you look across the, um, where the equator would be, you can see that the jungles are, there's very little light. Um, and then once you, you get to the, the polar areas, again, the light seems to change. And then we looked at this map of the, of the, the, the world at nighttime with the lights. And we used that to sort of create our, our principal areas because we wanted to have areas that weren't dictated by being a national park or something. We were looking for something that was massive, expansive, bigger than a, a single entity that you can hold in your, your head. You know, I, I'm, I'm South African. You can hold the idea of the Kruger National Park in your head. You know what it looks like. But if you take in an area that is... For example, we chose Namibia in um, Africa for our thing. And if you look at this map uh, for the at the um, lights in Namibia, there's almost none. And that is what we were looking for. The entire coastline of Namibia was almost pitch black. And so that was that was a decision. Here's a, another sh s uh, slide. Let me show you. I, I, think, I think it's important here to say that we decided, um, obviously speaking to people, everybody had their favorite wilderness and it became really difficult, particularly with publishers, as to decide on what to include and exclude. So we chose one vast contiguous area in each continent. And so I think Peter can run through um, yeah, well, what, this is, they, what they were. This is, this is Patagonia that we've got up on the screen at the moment. The extreme left-hand side is the Fjordland. Um, you can see the boundary with Argentina between Chile and Argentina that essentially runs just to the east of the Andes Mountains. So the Andes, the Fjordland, and then the desert to the east of it, that was very obviously an area that we would think. But here's one that's very exciting. This, this, this place completely turned me on. That's Tibet. And it's just, it's gigantic. <laughs> Absolutely gigantic. Um, it's uh, about 2,000 kilometers across and about 1,500 1, kilometers wide, and there's nothing. So, yeah, we'll get to that later. But when we started looking at this, it was like the lights came on, but because they'd gone off. <laughs> so, yeah, it was very, very exciting uh, to, to discover that. And then in North America, we chose Alaska and the Yukon, which is the same if you see northern, um, northern Alaska and the northern territories, particularly at night. In Europe, we, although we explored a lot of Scandinavia, we finally settled on Svalbard um, in the high Arctic. And then Asia, we chose to the Tibetan Plateau, obviously. Um, in Australia, it was the northwestern section of the Kimberley area, very, very sparsely populated area. And then as Peter said in Namibia, the skeleton coast. And we specifically chose that again because of the very, very small population and the entire coastline is actually a declared national park. And then Antarctica, which um, self-explanatory. We actually, we actually began in Antarctica. Um, we, um, what we did for this project was we we have a specific uh, a Land Rover that's built specifically for um, outdoor photography. It's built for long long distance camping or staying out there for a long time. So we got a shipping sponsor from Germany, um, Rick Mislini, 
actually uh, sponsored us the transport of our vehicle right around the world and ourselves for the entire project, which was very exciting. Well, we couldn't have done we it. We couldn't have done it them. without them. Yeah. And uh, they shipped our vehicle across to Argentina. We drove flat out down to uh, Tierra del Fuego and we got on a ship to Antarctica. And uh, I just wanted to show you the, the covers. This is. Um, the, the cover of the book that it took us five years, four and a half years to make this book, four and a half years traveling around the world to make the book. And um, the cover came from Antarctica. So that's, uh, that's a place called Gold Harbor on um, South Georgia Island. But uh, yeah, it, it was very exciting. The, the, I think the South African cover is next. We'll get to that one. That's in, in the Nam of Desert. But let, let's go to Antarctica. Here, this is where we we started the journey. And uh, to explore Antarctica, you you have to do it by ship. So we joined a couple of different expeditions. Where I think we went we went on two. Yes, yeah, yeah two different. Yeah, we went on two weeks, different ex yeah. expeditions three each different. three weeks. So we spent a total of a month and a half in Antarctica, and it really I think it remains for both of us probably our favorite continent. Everything um, was so terribly um, unexpected and new. Having grown up in Africa, one just nothing can prepare you for the landscape of Antarctica. So I think we we have to go back. Yeah, I, we're always wanting to go back. It's just the budgets. <laughs> we worked as informal um, photography guides, so we we did a trade off because it's very difficult to actually take your photographs if you're working as a guide. So we had our time and and then their time, and it worked it worked very well for us. We were very 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 lucky with that too. Um, yeah, let me let me run you through a few of the end. The, the exciting thing about Antarctica is that the influence of man is almost non-existent. There is some influence, obviously, on the islands surrounding the Antarctic Peninsula when there was whaling and that sort of thing going on in the uh, 1800s uh, and the early 1900s. There's um, some remnants of that left behind but these days it's pretty much small research stations and the continent in its natural state and that's incredibly exciting it just really is absolutely remarkable to go into a place where the animals number one have no fear of you it's it's remarkable to be in a place where animals have no fear of you they don't see you as a predator they see you as another animal and it's it's so disconcerting as a human being you know you, you you're another animal suddenly <laughs> so, it, it, we're not used to being like that and here's a here's a picture of a, a um, antarctic fur seal and he's telling me off he's telling me i you get out of here chap this is my spot <laughs> and, uh, it it was very um, humbling and, and exciting. I loved it. But, uh, what else? Yeah, you know, I've got I've got lots of pictures. I'm going to share about ten images per, uh, from four of the destinations that we went to. I, we haven't got time for everything this evening. Um, but did you find that in Antarctica, out of all the wilderness places you went to, that was quite unique in that the animals were the most comfortable with 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 you as as humans yes definitely other animal. yeah definitely uh the only other place where animals uh well there were two other places really polar bears in in the arctic uh found us very interesting uh, that we were on the menu um and the other place that we were on the menu was in the kimberley in australia the crocodiles definitely considered us food and that that's that's exciting you know it's it's interesting to be stalked by a wild animal because it has no fear of you having not been hunted before and yes it's scary but it it puts things into a perspective that we we very seldom have these days that um you know where where wilderness is so pure that the animals regard you as just another animal not the sort of ultimate species and, and something to be afraid of. I think of. that the birds in the Arctic uh, were also very accepting of us. And one wouldn't say tame, but, but essentially you could, you could walk and move among them and they would just continue with what they were doing. 
yeah, this is this is the image from the cover. Uh, that's the full image from the cover. It's a place called Gold Harbor on um, South Georgia Island. Um, this is actually very close to the place where Shackleton was rescued. Finally, uh, we you walked over those mountains in the background there. And they're, uh, they're king penguins. Yeah, and these are king penguins. And and this is a small colony. There's only ten or fifteen thousand birds there. There's you know there's colonies with six hundred thousand, and uh, it it really is astounding to see life in that sort of thing. And I think this shows you how unafraid they are of you. It's uh, you know, if you sit down and and sit still, they're entirely curious. You're this really strange looking animal. You don't look like an elephant seal or a fur seal. You're you're something different. So they come up and and peck at your clothes. And <laughs> the unwritten rule is that they can come to you. You can't approach them with a, within a certain distance. And this is precisely what happened. The moment you sit down and you get on their level, then they come right up to you. Yeah, it's a. Uh, you could you could you could just you could spend hours and hours just watching. These are these are king penguins. So you, as you can see from the scale with Beverly sitting there, they're they're big animals, um, big birds, and they. But there's there's a great variety of them. But the kings are are the sort of um, totem species for South Georgia, I think, because they're so pretty and they're big, and they occur in extremely large colonies. The smaller penguins tend to have smaller colonies, except on one or two of the islands, there's, there's some big colonies, but um, they, they really are the, 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 the big one. This is, um, this is South St. Andrew's Bay. I think. This is, yeah, this is St. Andrew's Bay. St. Andrew's Bay, and this is a breeding colony. You can see the, the brown ones are the chicks and the adults, obviously, in their full plumage. But that photograph gives you an idea of the density. The St. Andrew's Bay, 600,000 penguins. It's quite remarkable. Were, were you ever given the sense that what you were seeing was incredibly rare and that because things are changing, if you come back in a while, it might not be like that? Was anyone around you saying, look, that glacier is changing or the amounts of penguins that you were seeing are different to what they were? Did you get that sense that you were also trying to capture and document a time and, and a wild place that, that could change? I think that was very, very much the case in the Arctic. We went, the Arctic, we went to glaciers where um, our guide would tell us that, you know, he was there eight years ago and the glacier was, one, was a kilometer um, longer or further out into the sea. And this is and a glacier that's 120 and, meters high and, and kilometer five kilometers and wide. He would show us the place and, and certainly with the bears. I mean, we just, we just struggled to find them and we had to go further and further north. And guides would say to us, last year, you know, this is where we would find them this last year. And, and we had um, Ian Sterling on board one of our trips, who is one of the top uh, polar bear scientists um, on earth. And he, he had maps of of where the ice was in previous years and, and where it was now. And it, it, for the, in the Arctic, it was a constant thing and a constant concern and almost a panic, which it sort of drove one to feel, we have to do something about this. We, we have to, you know, we have to go back and communicate this to the world. And in the Arctic, it is, it is changing, but it's, it's far more gradual um, at, in the Antarctic. It is far more gradual at present. Um, I think it's just so much, you know, there is a continent under Antarctica and so much more ice, whereas in the Arctic, it, as you, you know, there's no land. It's on the sea. It's yeah. just, it just a, a great ice sheet. So obviously the melting is, and, and the proximity to, to the whole of the settled northern hemisphere is so much closer. But there's, there's so much science behind this. It just isn't really time to go into it. But I think in the Antarctic, we just felt that we were constantly being reminded of how, how it was, how it can be, how, how it should stay. And I think that was the thing. We started to think about you know, the Serengeti and how important it was because that is, it has huge pressure. There's all the people. There's um, you know the the tourism which is growing and everything else and so it was what was in our mind constantly in, in Antarctica because we were seeing it how it how it always was. 
Except for the whales. The, the whales were, were, were not a, a fraction of what they used to be, but it's encouraging. They are starting to come back, particularly the humpbacks are, are making a, a pretty uh, good comeback. But the big whales like the fin whales and the blue whales, we saw very few. And, you know, just the fin whales, for example, we only really caught up with them in the 1920s, 19, mid 1920s, when uh, we had um, ships with uh, harpoons, explosive harpoons on the bow, and that could swim, go faster than the whales could. Those whales go at about 25 to 30 knots, which is extremely fast in the water. Uh, and the, the old sailors with their rowboats could never keep up with them, so they escaped. And then suddenly they developed motorized boats with explosive harpoons. We killed 250,000. Sure. Yeah. I'm sure. sorry, Michael. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, you. uh, You're a whale lover. Yeah, it's just... Yeah. Um, you know, and the, but the, we stopped doing it, fortunately, and that's really what our book is about is, 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 you know, there's so much magnificence out there. We should be looking after it, and it's, it's falling to our generations. I mean, Beverly and I are probably the end of a generation, but the younger generation should really be looking to it because it's become critical in, in the period of our lifetime. We are seeing such dramatic change to wilderness and wildlife. And if we if we stop caring about it, if we let it slip, it's going to go faster than than people. You know, a lifetime is nothing. It's a blink of an eye in, in the time of Earth's history. And, and we have the responsibility to look after it. And that's really why we made this book. I just want to go to the next photograph and just... But um, we actually saw... A, um, a whale on this day. Uh, this is, it was snowing in Antarctica. This is Fournier Bay. I think. Yeah, Fournier Bay. Yeah, yeah. and uh, this was one of the first days that we saw whales. It was a bit early because we went early in the season. Um, and this whale came up. This is snow on the sea. It was snowing so hard and the sea is so cold that the snow sat on the sea and didn't melt and actually formed this. It looked like land with the fishes in it. And we were out there on the deck. The deck was very slippery. Uh, and suddenly, poof, through the middle of this comes this massive whale blow. And it's a whale down there. It was, it was remarkable. Absolutely fabulous. So, so it, the Palma Archipelago. Yeah. yeah. So it's, um, it was very exciting. Whales, I think, are a barometer that we are doing, making some changes that are for the good. Um, they are recovering. Uh, you know, the ban on them has been effective. And I think that there's a lot more that, um, not particularly our generation, but the, the, the world to come will find that we can turn things around. I think there's certain things that we can't, but we can turn some things around. And that's really what our book is about. We don't want to be dismal and, and depressing in our ideas. We want to say that we have the opportunity. We have a magnificent earth. It's still there, and we can go ahead and 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 look after it and conserve it. And uh, you know, there's a remark. This is a a tiny little bird. He's that big. Is that a Wilson storm petrel, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, it's it's a storm petrel. He's this big, and he lives out there in the ocean. And he relies on us not putting plastic out there. You know, so that he the krill survives. He doesn't start eating plastic, and that that bird is incredible he lives out there in the this extreme weather these massive waves and he's completely comfortable in the term just by himself that one little bird is it, it's a remarkable thing it's a remarkable thing i think this is the thing that is so humbling is you know out being out there in your double thick boots uh, double thick fur line boots and all your waterproof gear and your beanie and going back to the ship and you have your warm cabin and there there is all this life out there which is perfectly comfortable and if left alone will continue will be healthy and will thrive and um, that's that's really what antarctica talk, taught us is that antarctica is not messed with by humans it, it's a it's a it's a continent that's under treaty I, I forget how many nations have signed it but it's quite a few at this point 
and we've left it alone. We, we're using it for scientific research. And if we can do that with what wilderness we have left on the earth, then we have the opportunity to preserve and look after this magnificence. You know, it's, uh, I always use the Kruger National Park as, as my example when people say, well, you know, it, uh, we've got some time. And I'm saying, mm, I don't think you've got that much time. But, you know, when, when Kru the Kruger was declared a reserve, 13 people visited it in the first year of its proclamation. 13, one, three. <laughs> and it's now 108 it's years six, later, 115 one six, years. 1.6 one one, million. Yeah, I think it's, but it's somewhere in the 1.5 million people per annum go and visit that place. That's in the space of 100 years. Can you imagine how important these places, these things are going to be in 500 years, a thousand years, imagine how important it's going to be that we have conserved these, these things for the future of the earth. It, it, we have no idea of the relevance, the, the exponential rev, uh, relevance of, of conservation. And that, that's something that us human beings are, are really plagued by. We see things in terms of a lifetime, and that, that's too short. I think we have to realize that we're one of one of the species on this earth. We're not these species, and without all the others, we're not actually going to survive. I'm going to see. I, th I think I'm. You know, there's the. I think that's the final image that I have from Antarctica. Again, it's a fulmar, and uh, it just gives you an idea of the power of the continent. The the incredible. It's remarkable to find life in a place like that. Absolutely remar remarkable. But when you find it in the profusion that exists down there, it, it just, uh, you stand there with your, your jaw on your chest. Do you find that the, the wilderness, great wilderness areas are really those that are inhospitable? You know, they're the deserts, they're these mountain plateaus, they are these hard to get to. Is that why they are still wild? Without definitely, question, yeah. definitely. Without question, that is that it, is what defines them. It's the hostility to to man's uh, occupation that keeps them wild. The only problem is, of course, that we we're getting better and better at surviving almost anywhere. And, and we're uh, getting more and more. <laughs> so I think th for us, the point is, we just have to decide. Governments have to decide. Politicians have to decide. The decision makers of the world have to decide. We we need to set wildland aside. The, the, no future negotiation. We just we we demarcate demarcate areas and we protect them. And we we have them. That was the the remarkable thing about this project: spending five years looking on every single continent on Earth for vast areas of wilderness. Not just as I say, not just a national park, but something that was expansive, really, really big that was the world as it existed always. And they're there. And that's the part that really is so uh, interesting and fascinating. Here, I'm going to move on to, we moved from Antarctica up to Patagonia. And as I showed you in the uh, earlier in, in the light section, we, we concentrated on the sort of ridge of the Andes going south from Puerto Montt in Chile. Uh, and Argentina, we went south from there all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. And because it's so hostile an environment, it's cold, it's wet, it's rainy, it's jungly, uh, it's very steep-sided, it's hard to, for human beings, and it's wild. Uh, the interesting thing in Patagonia, though, was that the um, most people uh, associate wild with, with animals. And in Patagonia, it's very hard to see the animals because they... They, they tend to be deep in the jungle or they're on the step. The things we saw most of were, uh, no, this is, a, this is a little green the birds, fire crown. The birds are magnificent. Yeah, the birds are great. And they are ever present. It's, it's a, it, very often in a long walk in the forest, you would just hear bird calls. You would see probably no other life um, because everything is in the undergrowth and then the birds would fly around. And so you, that would sort of, um, keep you going because around the next corner you just might see another bird. <laughs> we this we is a green backed fire crown. Yeah, it's a green backed fire crown. Look, yeah. yeah. But um, then the, then the, you get these are the locals. This was the interesting part is that the 
The locals are very, very um, traditional. There's the, the, it's, it's very mountainous, very um, steep-sided country. So roads are few and far between. There's one, one road in Chile and, and one essentially in Argentina that follow the, the range of the Andes south. Um, and so the locals all get around on horseback and they're very traditional. And, but the interesting thing is that when you have people that are traditional like this and they get around on horseback and on, on foot, they have quite a profound impact on the animals uh, because most of these guys go around with dogs. And so we found that as soon as you got estancias or little puestos where there were a few locals, there would be a retreat of wildlife locally, but there would be a retreat of wildlife. Um, so even on a small scale, we need to be aware that we make a dramatic effect on the uh, environment around us. And, um, but there, then this is down south in Patagonia, at a very famous place called um, Torres del Paine. Uh, it's a national park, but it's, it's beautiful. It really, that, that image is very much about what Patagonia feels like. It's okay. spectacular. Could you could you just um, touch on the wonderful initiatives that's going on there with with farmland being converted? You talked about there are places that are giving you hope. Is is Patagonia one of those? Uh, very definitely. The, uh, well, it, we actually um, I think we dedicated our book. We uh, we dedicated our book to the people that are doing this. Uh, this is uh, an image taken in one of the parks. That, uh, it's the Tompkins Conservation, uh, Chris and, and Doug Tompkins. Unfortunately, Doug passed away uh, a year or so ago and from hypothermia. He fell out of his canoe and died from hypothermia. But Chris is continuing the work. But they, they were both uh, philanthropists, um, successful business people who turned uh, what assets they had, they decided that they were going to, Doug was a mountaineer, uh, very, very fond of uh, South America. And Chris um, obviously followed with him down there. She was also in very much, she is very much into the outdoors. And they saw all this vast estancias, very, very big farms. And they said, well, why don't we buy them and up and start turning them into national parks. They, agriculturally, they're, they're very marginal, very fringe agriculturally, but if we returned them to their natural state, we could, we could do something remarkable. And I think the latest National Geographic actually has an article on uh, both of them um, and the work that they've done, but they've conserved millions of hectares of wilderness. They've created at least six or seven national parks. They call themselves uh, Conservation Patagonia. And what they've done, or Thompson, Tompkins Conservation, what they did was they went and bought farms. This image here is a farm that they bought um, in Chile. This is Park Patagonia. And they, they yeah. created yeah. Park Patagonia, which is a massive park now because it joins a small national park in the south That's with a small national park in the north. The and they bought this, and yeah, Yenemini and, and something else, but they bought this big tract of land in the middle. And what it's done is it's created this remarkably diverse habitat that goes from lowland lakes right through to the heights of the Andes and then high altitude plateaus. And they're conserving everything from animals that love ice down to the puma and, and rhea. You know, it, what it's has just, happened is that the animals have come back. I mean, the Viscacha was endangered. The puma is, is very much endangered down in South America. The Guanaco, um, there's different foxes. They've been doing this for 30 or 40 years, and they, it, it, it's really starting. Really? Yeah, they, they're starting to, antelope. it's really starting to gain traction. I think that the, um, South Americans initially were very, very hesitant. They, they thought that um, the Tompkins were just coming in to create big private American farms and um, take away the national heritage. They did not believe that people were paying them to give them back. To, you um, know, to create national parks and uh, the people are much in support of it. Yeah, now they really have, they have presidential support, both sides, Argentina and in Patagonia. And so, he's, he's now 
parks are getting a lot of uses now because they feel that there were visitor centers and properly run campsites. And so I think it's, it's, it's also drawn in the local people, which is, which is very different to creating a venue for international tourists and, and conservationists. But it, it really gives one hope, Michael, you know, when you see what, you know, yes, they, they spent millions, but in terms of the world economy, it's, it's, a, it's a tiny little drop. And yet they have conserved these enormous and critically important areas of South America. As I say, 500 years from now, people are going to say, this is incredible. You know, look at what we've still got. And, and they did it with very comparatively very little backing and very little money. They, I mean, it's a lot more than I have, but it's remarkable what can be achieved. So the Tompkins are very much um, our sort of role models of what can be done. We actually dedicated the book Wildland to them because they are so unique in what they, they've actually not just talked about it, they've shared it, they've done it. They've made it happen. And that was, that was really a very impressive to us. I'm going to, I think I there's think, a few I more think pictures here. a lot here. of conservationists, our hearts are in the right place, but it is always so difficult to know what to do next. But um, this we, is uh, very, very far south. There's um, one of the parks that they've created is at an Alexa National Park. Uh, they've done it in association with other um, land philanthropists, people that have given their uh, given money to buy land. This is Tierra del Fuego. This is looking from the Beagle Channel onto Tierra del Fuego. This is the kind of country that they are conserving. Um, here's another, but this is also taken in... There's Perito Marina. Yeah, that's Perito. Is that Perito Marina? Yeah, na National Park. Yeah, so that's a National Park. Those are um, Guanaco, which is the South American, I would say, Impala, if we were to look at the, <laughs> the African equivalent. It's, it's the most common wild animal, and it's found on the high-altitude steppe. It's a, it's, a kind, it's a relation of the llama. But this is this is the country that this is um, also part of. Um, it's Park Patagonia. Park Patagonia, yeah, mm -hmm. really, and that's you. You get an idea there of the magnificence of the country that can be preserved. That it's still. I mean, if we look, this is a sweeping picture. That is all land that used to be it's farmland. All all but you can, and but now you, the, the vegetation is also recovered. But you can see that the impact of the estancia was so small that what the Tompkins did was just take down the fences and it, it reverted. And that's that's how close we sit. Take down the fences and the land reverts, and within 20 years you you get the national park. It's very exciting. It's very, very encouraging. And um let's see. This is um I just want to share a few more images of, of Patagonia with you. This is uh, Lago Leones, um, also in the Chilean side. It's a very remote place. It takes a day and a bit walking to get there. I think it's Laguna San Rafael National right. Park. Yeah, it's somewhere, but very, very, it's, it's magnificent country and vast, really. Uh, Patagonia, because of the yeah. mountains, you know, I was chatting to Doug around the fire one evening and um, Doug Tompkins and you know I was talking about Park Pumalin which was the, the first park that they created and he said to me Pete you walked in you got one and a half kilometers in that park extends for another 90 kilometers to the border can you imagine what's in there he said I'll fly you over we never did get to fly but he said I'll fly you over so you can see but this is what it was like inside of there it's just remarkable that there is so much wilderness out there and we just if we we take action and conserve it we can really make a difference this is um one, one of my favorite images from from the book it's a uh, it's a extremely endangered uh, south american antelope and it likes ice it's completely unafraid. Yeah, and of, this is it's so it's so scary because you know that it's 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 dangerous for it yeah. to, to actually approach you as it's, a human being. This is to shoo it away. This is in the deep south of, of the Chilean Fordland. It's um, in Bernardo Higgins National Park, which is on the edge of the the ice cap. I don't know if our 
the people that are tuned in are aware, but in Chile, as you move south, there's an ice cap that extends from the mountains into the sea for, and it blocks all access. You can go so far south and then no more because it, the, on the other side, there's land again, but you, you cannot get past the ice cap. This is just the beginning of the ice cap and these deer love the fringes of the ice. I'm not sure exactly why, what, what it is that they like about the habitat, but they were so unafraid of us because they, they just don't see people down there. It's so remote. Um, that we would lie down, they come and lie next to us, like dogs. This is yeah. at Bernardo O'Higgins Glacier, and I think the reason that there are Quimili there in, in, the, in a wild state is because it's so remote. I mean, it took us um, an entire day's boat trip, um, having gone to the closest, closest point um, of on, departure, the, on the yeah. edge of, yeah. of land, of landfall, into the, into the archipelago to get here. And I think that is why we found this. I see I'm, I'm, I'm talking too much, but I, I, I just want to run through a few of the other destinations. I've got two more I want to cover with you. Tibet, as I said, was just enormous and, just and go through the pictures, maybe. beautiful. These are kyung. These are wild ass or zebras. They like the, the zebra of, of Asia. And that image from, from the day I started photography, I had images like this in my head. <laughs> and uh, I, I was just so happy that we were actually able to cap capture this image. This was taken on my birthday in, in Tibet. And it was a real birthday present. But, uh, we'd camped out on this, this plane. Yeah, we'd camped out on this plane. And uh, don't, don't go too fast. I want to explain the picture. But we'd camped out on this plane. It was absolutely bitterly cold. It was so cold that our tent froze from our breath on the inside. And we could lift it up. It was solid. It was this ice block from the inside. But uh, we were presented with that image at, at, in the morning. This is a traditional Tibetan uh, woman wearing jewelry. We just came and and we love the shot because it... It, it has the wistful aspect of, that we feel is um, at the, the core of Tibetan, uh, where the Tibetans are at the moment. They're, they're wistful. They, they're longing for their land. Uh, I don't think that they uh, have a lot of chance of, of retaining it, but they are they're very, very passionate and very deeply associated with the land. We, we looked at, we didn't look at the urban areas, we looked at the nomads. This woman is uh, part of a nomad community and they, they live in a land without fences, which is really absolutely remarkable. This is one of the high altitude lakes. Um, this, all these photographs are taken anything above 4,000 meters, between four and five and a half thousand meters. So it's terribly high. The air is very, very thin. Uh, it's very cold. But the fact that it is a savanna on the scale that it is, is just remarkable. It, it really, we were very excited to find Tibet. And uh, the uh, Chinese authorities have, have made massive uh, reserves up there. They really, the, the Chang Tang, the... Um, you know the names better. Chang Chang, the Ho, Ho Kil and the Sang Lian Yuan um, are three massive reserves, which is, which is a relief and a gift, considering the incredible developments that they are also uh, pushing into Tibet um, in the hydroelectric uh, electricity areas and mining and, and that sort of thing. The development is huge. So the fact that they've declared these reserves is, is a huge relief and gift. And particularly um, critical when you go there and you see what what is still wild and can be preserved. This is this is a I just put this in because this was a highlight day. We we were photographing just walking around photographing woolly hares actually, and we noticed some movement. And there with the, the this this animal. This is a palace's cat. It's a, about the size of a domestic cat. And I wonder how many of your viewers can see that there's two cats there. <laughs> the second one looking at you is, is often missed. And, and that's why we missed them. We were, we were close by. We didn't see them until they moved. But a uh, very exciting, very beautiful little animal. We then spent three days uh, camped out here photographing these two. But this is very much what the uh, 
Tibetan plateau looks like. That's a kiang. It's, as I say, the zebra or wild ass of Tibet. There's big herds of them. We, once you get out into these areas where the plains are vast away from uh, the roads and the infrastructure, it's like the Serengeti. There really are just herds everywhere of the kiang, of the goa, uh, and, or, and a few other animals. This is an image of Tibet that um, not many people have seen or, or think of as, as Tibet, but it's a... Um, it's like a, a Grand Canyon view of, of the, there's an area here that is obviously sand, much, much more sandy and more erodible. And, and they, because it's close to the Himalaya, it gets a lot of weather. And um, the erosion has caused this really dramatic uh, landscape, very, very similar to the Grand Canyon in America and on the same sort of scale, but far less known. Uh, and we were very excited to find that. And this is, is actually being preserved. There is a, res a, a reserve there. And this is typical of Tibetan weather. <laughs> this is what you wake up to in the morning. <laughs> Your yaks are frozen over. <laughs> Remarkably stoic animals, but I, I love the image because it, it, the stoicism and the cold uh, really are... are shown to the to advantage yeah, i think beverly is trying to look up where that it's that um is. the langton tsangpo river valley langton tsangpo river valley was the previous image i don't know how to go backwards on this and that is oh, also there. yeah that it one is, it, is, <laughs> it is also like that because it is right next to the himalaya so basically it gets all of the weather without the precipitation yeah so it's very very interesting um this is a little owl we found in the snow uh, he, he looks as miserable as I felt. <laughs> it was cold, <laughs> but I, I just loved the, the the image with the snow falling. And and that's that was what we found about Tibet is that right next to the road there were no fences and wildlife coming and going, uh, just like the Serengeti. And this is um, such a beautiful animal. This is a wild yak, wild. So he's very, very different to the um, domestic yak. You can see he he looks much more like the Spanish bullfighting bull than, than the uh, domestic yak, and he has the same temperament. They're very aggressive, very assertive, and you, know, you, you, <laughs> you, you keep your distance with them. But it was really wonderful to find them, and we found them in pretty good numbers. Uh, in certain areas in Tibet. They seem to like the mountains rather than the flat step, but uh, we found decent herds, 20 animals with, with youngsters and that sort of thing, and f fairly frequently. They weren't uncommon. So We were very pleased to have our guide attending with us because he could recognize from a, from a long distance, which was a wild yak. <laughs> we have completely different behavioral <laughs> techniques and we'd have to crawl up to these on our bellies below ridges and as opposed to just walking among them. And but um, that, that's the wild yak. That was a domestic yak. Um, but, you know, what's, what's interesting is that the Tibetan plateau, with all its development, it's the Buddhist mantra of respect for life that has really ensured that this wilderness remains intact it's it's an association the people are there those are those are domestic yaks in this wilderness vast wilderness and the people are there moving with their their yaks through it but the dalai lama in 2006 issued a statement to the tibetan people that they really have to start completely respecting their um their wildlife and their wilderness because those are other souls that are on the earth with them and that just transformed it it stopped the hunting the people started reporting uh foreigners I, i'm afraid to say that um, westerners from canada going in there for mining exploration uh the chinese were hunting um and they were hunting you know and uh, the tibetans turned around and said listen the Lama, the Dalai Lama has said, we, we need to respect this. We want you to stop. And it's really changed the, the, the dynamic of the place. And that's a place that has no laws, no fences, no game ranges, no nothing. They just, 
it's the paradigm of the people's respect that has changed the place. Okay, and I'm going to go quickly, I see I'm running out of time, quickly to Namibia, our favorite continent. Uh, this is where we were born. This is where we, we've spent most of our time. And here we, we chose the Skeleton Coast because it is such a vast, it's 3,000 plus kilometers of coastline. And Namibia re recently set a precedent a few years ago, actually, by declaring the entire coastline a national park. There's no other country in the world that's done that. So the school, the Skeleton Coast, almost for its entirety, with the exception of the few two or three towns that are on its um, the small coastal port areas, the entire coast is a national park. And that's, that's again an example of what can be achieved with the will. Yeah, and these are, this is the kind of thing that you find in the skillets. It's very arid. We wanted a place that was different and arid, uh, that, that supported wildlife. That's uh, in the Hoonab River Valley. Those are the Etendeka Mountains. Uh, Beverly and I spent a year here working on the Himba a book on the Himba people in the 1980s. We were the first people in after the war. And the change is dramatic. There's a lot more people and a lot less elephants. And that, that is one of the things that we've, this valley particularly, the elephants are suffering terribly as a result. Their numbers are declining and declining and declining. The populations are small, less than 30, and they're going down. I which is that, very worrying. I think the thing is, though, is that it's still so remarkable that the wildlife is there. And it's exactly what you said in the beginning, Michael. It's only because the landscape is so inhospitable. But again, isn't it a miracle that you find elephants there at all? And for this reason, we, you know, we have to stop and, and consider what we're going to do about it. We have to keep them. Yeah, I mean, imagine not living in a world without this. I mean, we live in a world without woolly mammoths. I'd love to have seen a woolly mammoth, but uh, we live without them. But why, why would we ever let this go? It, it's beyond me. And that's really why we made the book. And I just, in, in coming to the close, I wanted to tell your viewers that we actually, whilst we were making the illustrated book, I was also writing every day because I felt that I really wanted to get to, uh, a larger audience than just the visual audience. So we have a book coming out at the end of this year called To the Edges of the Earth, which is the written journey. It's, it's the written story of this journey that we undertook to make this book. I, this image is just particularly, lo I love it because it, it speaks to me of where the rhino stands. It's on the, on the cusp of disappearing. It's a shadowed animal. And it's prehistoric. It's been here forever. How can we possibly, on our watch, let that happen? I'm not going to. <laughs> Just not going to. Thank you. That was very, very beautiful. Are oh, you almost uh, sorry? Uh, yeah, there's there's a few more images. I'll just shoot through them. But I see uh, my time is is done. Well, thank you very much for inviting this us, is, Michael. This I don't think we realized that we had so much to say. <laughs> <laughs> this no, is the, the written book. Um, yeah. it, it's not available yet. It will be available in December. As I said to you, I think earlier, that uh, if you want to pre-order, we will accept pre-orders. Just click on the website and you can pre-order it. But um, we don't know the price or the shipping cost yet. I think that the written work has, has got so much more um, than, than we can say, because we, we met so many interesting people whose views are included in the book, and so many um, indigenous people who, who lived in places that we only visited. And so I think we, we, we just felt that we needed more than the photographic book. We needed to tell the story because it wasn't just our story. Um, before we, we're opening it up to questions, so if any of you have questions, please won't you type it in the chat function or in the Q&A, and I'll try and get through as many as we can. I know we don't have much time. But firstly, um, you mentioned earlier when we were speaking in, 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 in person about the rarity of these wild spaces. And when you look back after these five years, how do you sum it up? Why do we need to conserve these areas? What is it? that makes them more rare than, than anything else. 
Well, I think that I think that's exactly it, Michael. Is that when we look at why we are losing wild space, why we are the urgent need for conservation because as soon as we lose the space we lose the species but it's not just the species it's the magnificent of the earth in its pristine condition and when i look for example at what uh, president trump has has opened up uh, the north slope of of alaska for oil and gas exploration the if you look at the the uh, alaska pipeline that was put in at an immense cost to the environment. And it, it's lasted 40 years. It's about to run out. And we have done some damage. We have done damage there that will last forever. It will, it's, it's irreparable. We cannot change it. We've, we've changed that environment, period. And the, the point that came across most strongly after spending five years in the wilderness is no matter what we human beings want to take from the land, the land itself is more rare than anything we'll take from it, be it gold, diamonds, golf courses, high-rise buildings, a nice marina, oil. oil, whatever it is, the land itself is rarer than any of those uh, commodities or minerals or, 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 or things that we want from it. And therefore, if it's rarer, why are we not seeing the value of that rarity? And that, that is really what, what came across, that wild land is the rarest precious commodity we have left on Earth. It's the rarest it's also, of all things. It's also irreplaceable. So it's irreplaceable. Once we, we've changed, we can't, we can't go back, you know. And so if you want to, if uh, Mr. Trump wants to take uh, oil out of the, the North Slope, then he is changing the scope of, of America's history forever. And he is putting aside for his own pocket and for the pocket of the contemporary American, he is putting aside the, the, the wealth of every single American to come. And that's, that's not fair. That's not right. I also think that we feel quite strongly that um, for our own, as a, as a human race, for our own spiritual um, and psychological well-being, we need wilderness areas. We need to be able to find places we can go where we're not in domination, where we can find our historical landscape, where we can recognize the place that we came from. Do you just, there's quite, a few, there's, that's, there's quite a few questions coming through that I want to try and get to. I completely concur with what you're saying, and I think it's incredibly inspiring and meaningful. Um, Meredith was saying here that she really found that the way you use positive language instead of doom and gloom, was that what you set out to inspire people with beauty that they fall in love with these places um, instead Absolutely. of just yeah. and, and want to? No, it, 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 it inspires us, you know, that's, that's yeah. what we're trying to tell the world is it's inspirational. If you, if you, you know, I think this is the fabulous thing about lockdown is we suddenly decided or, or realized how important it is to be able to step outside, just outside. And let's take that idea, just stepping outside, suddenly the entire world realized, this is vital to my sanity. Now, if we take that idea and expand it to the whole of humanity and our earth, why, why can't we extrapolate that very simple idea? Yes, let's extrapolate it. It's good for us. It I makes us feel wonderful. I also yeah. think that um, there is there's so much doom and gloom um, on the planet right now. And the only way we can get away from it is, is to step outside, is to go and sit on a rock looking over the sea, to, to go for a walk in the mountains. That's how we escape the doom and gloom. It's a mirror to our souls. And essentially, I think our souls want to be happy. And I think you've achieved that. You've obviously inspired thousands of people um, you said there were 30,000 books printed in five different languages. Um, can people get them in every continent in different languages in terms of Wildland before this one comes out? Where do they first find Wildland? Well, Wildland is, is available um, through our website. We're sold out, unfortunately, completely sold out in the UK and Europe. Uh, we we still have some copies in we sold out in Australia. We are still have some copies in they come up the on, United States. They come up on Amazon. Um, and we have copies in Africa. We we yeah. still have copies here, 
that if you're happy to pay the shipping to wherever you are, we'll do that. Um, it's what we just shipped a book to Greece yesterday. It was twenty, fifty yeah. dollars, quite yeah. a lot. Yeah. But, uh, it's, it's if you st if start on Amazon because copies come up, and um, I'm not really sure how the publishing world works. Um, I mean, we even sold into China, which was a real breakthrough. I yeah, think, we got because, a Chinese edition, which was yeah, very exciting. Just the Chinese to protect <laughs> their land was, um, you know, well. Anything we could do, but to no, that. we do have uh, copies. You have a look at wildlandphoto.com and you can see uh, where to buy the book. If, if it's not in the area that you're in, let us know and we'll try and find one for you. I think there's a, a email address. And yeah. to the edges of the earth, when do you think that will be out? That'll be out in December. This, this, this coming December, we're, we're hoping to get in just before the Christmas market. So, um, but if you'd like that, the only place you can pre-order it is on the wildlandphoto.com uh, website. There is a shop section you'll see. Uh, you can click onto the edges and, and just, if you click it emails me, let just give me your address or Beverly your address and uh, we'll be in touch with you as soon as we have the uh, scheduled publication date and the costs, including shipping. Uh, I will already see Rose here saying, I would like five, please order them. <laughs> so I'll pick <laughs> uh, Thank just, you. Just a very quick, uh, quick question. Um, I'm just trying to see if I've missed any here very quickly. The one Ian wanted to know with regards to the endangered uh, buck in Patagonia, why are they so endangered if this region is so inaccessible to humans? Are they just um, not many left? That, that's like, simply because the. Um, they're endangered because they never occurred in large numbers and their habitat is now restricted entirely to the fjordlands of, of Chile on the cold, and si cold side of the uh, Andes Mountains. So they used to extend quite a lot further up on both sides, but they've been, their habitat because of human in, in, in intervention has shrunk tremendously. I think in our in our entire time down to to the Bernardo Higgins Glacier and inside the national park, we probably saw fifteen. But so, the uh, the other um, issue is they, that they're so that's, tame. That's very very small numbers for, um, and that is the, as as I mentioned, they are they occur there because of the fact that it is so remote and inhospitable. Whereas they used to occur in much much greater numbers and and across. The whole of southern Patagonia. But I think that the fact that they are so unafraid of humans made them easy to slaughter. It's very understandable. Look, there's a few more questions about how did you travel in Chile from Porto Mont to Patagonia if there were no roads, but I'm going to urge people to buy your book because I'm sure you'll explain how you got around and how you took there, your... There, is a, there are roads, but we walked a lot, and, horseback and, 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 and ferries. And we, ferries, We yeah. took ferries in the archipelago um, or we, we hired um, a boat to take us um, across the water. And Deirdre quickly wanted to ask you before I, I close, she said, if you had to choose one of those seven places out for South Africans to go and visit outside of Africa, which one would be on the top of your list? <laughs> Depends what your priority is yeah. at, uh, and, and how, what your budget is. Antarctica is amazing because it is the one continent on earth that remains pristine, if, but it's expensive to visit because you have to do it on an expedition ship. I would say that if you were um, working on a more limited budget, uh, Tibet is difficult to get to because the permissions are, are hard to come by. It takes a lot of uh, red tape to, and, and bureaucratic approvals before you can get in there. Uh, it took us a lot of um, working to get all our permits in there. I would probably say Alaska. Alaska and the Yukon in Canada, these are, they, you, you want to be able, you need time because it's big, big country. It's very accessible though there's ferries, it's accessible ferries everywhere and, and it's still um, wild and um you know one can hike for, for days and days and days there's just the bear being um aware of the bears of the grizzlies and use bear sprays or or go with a guide because the guides can carry a weapon which you would hopefully never use but 
but you but it's it's safe and you can go a lot of places with vehicles and then hike out you can yeah. hike out for if you're prepared you can, to walk it's it's great country you can also be dropped um, by airplane um in, into the any of the wilderness areas and then walk out um Brilliant. as long as you want well, thank you so much. I see Felix just joined from the UK and he said, sorry, you got the time wrong. So just to everyone, this is being recorded and we will put it up on all the social media platforms so you can share with family and friends. And thank you both of you. I, I feel very inspired from, you know, the Tibetans who are talking about respect for nature to Patagonia to one family or philanthropist who are really inspiring, you know, those with means to make a difference and to a country like Namibia who preserved you know, just, just showing us that it, it is possible and uh, no matter on what scale is incredibly inspiring. And thank you for doing what you're doing. Really looking forward to this. And um, we'll stay in contact. Best of luck. Thank you so Wonderful. much. Well, thank you, Michael. I, thank I'd just you. like to, to yeah. end off saying to everybody who's watched it, don't think that you can't do anything. Your little bit makes a huge difference. And also, thank you to Michael. What are you doing? Yeah, you're it's an example of it. Yeah, well so thank done. you. Without you, we wouldn't be doing this. Yeah. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a great evening. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.